All right, so let's keep this energy going. Next up, we have award-winning journalist and former television executive, Paula Madison. Paula embodies the essence of intersectionality and diversity. Known widely for her role as principal owner of the Africa Channel and for her personal crusade to tell the story of her Chinese ancestry from China to the Caribbean and back, Madison will share the power of broadening our perception of racial identity through unique storytelling. This is an opportunity for next-gen creatives, for all of us, to hear about the power of diasporic stories. Everyone, please welcome Chairman and CEO, Madison Media Management, LLC, and principal owner of the Africa Channel, Paula Madison. Thank you, Dana. It's uh, such a pleasure to be with you all today. And I want to say that I so enjoyed uh, the previous discussion because um, Kelly Edwards actually worked for me at NBC Universal. And it's great seeing her, um, even if I'm just seeing her in a little box, but I've been listening for about the past 20 minutes. And Kelly, if you can hear me, I miss you. It was great hearing your voice and, and hearing all your wisdom again. So thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm here to talk to you today uh, from the perspective of being um, African-American um, and also Chinese-American and also Jamaican-American and also Blasian. Uh, I'm here to speak to you from the perspective of um, how in telling stories that are about us as a people, that those stories encompass more of a totality of who we are. You know, we, we are really um, global citizens, and it's very, very important, I think, for us to perceive ourselves as such, especially when living in a time where um, our home nation, United States, seems to be going through a push-pull, a tug over just how much we are members of the history and the society of the United States. Uh, I too wrote a book that was published back in uh, 2014. And uh, I spent years as a uh, journalist, as a newspaper and television executive and I, I had decided, uh, frankly, when I was six years old, that I was going to stop working at some point in order to find uh, my Chinese grandfather or my Chinese grandfather's descendants. I hadn't really uh, known where to find them, but my mother, who, um, in a very low-tech way, I will show you, um, this is my book, Finding Samuel Lowe. And here is a photo, look closely, of my mother, who her mother was African Jamaican and her father was Chinese. And he left China in 1905 as a 15 year old and journeyed to Jamaica where he intended to make enough money to send back to China, which was um, suffering from some economic hardship. When my mother told us, my two older brothers and me, stories about our family, keep in mind that my mother, who looked Chinese, mixed race as she was, but she looked Chinese and had a heavy Jamaican accent. She had three children who did not look Chinese and who were born and raised in Harlem. My mother at that time was a single mother. She and my father had split. He was Jamaican, Af African Jamaican. And we grew up looking like everybody else in the neighborhood and just being kids in the neighborhood until my mother would show up and come outside and call us in for dinner or lunch or whatever. And, and for the people in our neighborhood who didn't know um, that Miss Nell was our mother, it would produce pretty much whiplash, like, like what, 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 what's happening here? Um, consequently, at a very early age, 
um, my brothers and I became very, very aware of race, of racism, and of, frankly, straddling cultures and straddling races in a way that many of the folks in our neighborhood did not. Um, we grew up in Harlem, as I said, and almost everybody in our neighborhood was either from North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia. The kids, for the most part, had also been born in Harlem, but it was so interesting having this sort of chain migration where you had families of an aunt and cousins and grandmother and, and, and uncles who hailed from a same community or same town in a Southern state. And here they all were living in the same building sometimes, in the same tenement or in the same block in Harlem. And we had the three of us and our mother who looked like she did not belong in this neighborhood at all. What it did for us was it, it sensitized us in many ways to a variety of matters and issues, including um, something as simple as speech, something as simple as how one speaks. As I mentioned, my mother had a heavy, heavy Jamaican accent. And when she would go into Patois, people would be standing right next to her and me and ask me, is she speaking English? And my mother would be so insulted. Usually her answer was her response, not even an answer. Her response was something like, jam idiot, and she'd storm off and walk away. Now, those things, for the most part, don't necessarily add up to nor constitute a very, very significant um, event. But I will, for the moment, just indulge me for a moment, I'm going to say the names of some other people who are Black and Asian. Otherwise, there is a fairly recently coined term, Blasian, Black Asians. Um, Naomi Osaka, uh, and I think his name is Rue, Hachimura of the NBA, Tiger Woods, Neo, Kellis, Naomi Campbell, Tyson Beckford, um, mixed with African diasporic people and Asian diasporic people. And so what you have in that regard is almost another um, subset of people who are roaming the planet and who sometimes feel very much a part of one group and sometimes feel not so much a part of one group. I'll give you an example. I also um, have a documentary called Finding Samuel Lowe. Um, the documentary chronicles uh, my, my two older brothers and myself and, and our offspring as we searched to find my grandfather's descendants. So there came a point where we wanted to identify where in the world our grandfather could have come from. And we found through my African Jamaican second cousin, uh, my father and he were first cousins, he said, oh, there are lots of Chinese Jamaicans in Toronto, where my cousin lived. He said, I'll ask them, where in China do most of them come from? Surprisingly to me, um, it took from the moment he shared that bit of information, I started searching more information on these people um, my cousin put me in touch with the organizers of this conference, uh, the Toronto Hakka Conference. Hakka is a um, is a cultural minority group in China, and by that I mean they hail from China. They are the genus is Han, so they are Chinese people, 
there are 80 million, 80, 80 million Hakka people in the world, most of them in China, but almost everybody in Jamaica who's mixed Chinese is Hakka. So these people have a conference every four years. My cousin contacted them. They said, oh, tell her to come. My family is the major owner of, as you heard in the introduction, the Africa Channel. So we took a crew along with us because we might have ended up discovering um, something that would be germane to shooting a documentary. Um, from the moment we set foot in that conference, which was June of 2012, um, this group of people, maybe 300 or so, most of whom looked completely Chinese, um, did not flinch when we said we were mixed race Chinese. First time in my entire life I had encountered people who didn't laugh or think it was a joke or like, what are you talking about? Um, and that's because these people knew what mixed race Chinese and black people looked like. We gave them as many clues as we could, as we had, and ultimately, what it turned out was six weeks later, I was in China meeting my mother's 92-year-old um, sister and 88-year-old brother, who my mother had never known and they had never known her. How was that possible? Because when my grandfather left China for Jamaica in 1905, he remained until 1933, at which time he had two loves and he had children with those two loves. His family sent a full Chinese woman sight unseen to Jamaica to marry him, which he did, and all eight of my grandfather's children, three who were mixed race by the two African Jamaican women, and five who were fully Han Chinese by the Chinese wife, all eight of my grandfather's children were in fact born in Jamaica. Jamaican birth certificates, birth certificates, Jamaican citizenship, and my grandfather began taking them to China to learn more about being Chinese. Uh, and then in 1933, he left Jamaica for good because of the racism against Chinese that was existing in Jamaica. He ended up going back to China permanently. My mother was left behind, um, not because he didn't want to take her, but because her mother, African Jamaican, was outraged that he married a Chinese woman when she wanted to be the one. I say all that to say that we found my mother's siblings, two of them initially, six weeks after I went to this conference. Um, when I returned to Jamaica with my brothers, I'm sorry, to China with my brothers and our other family members, we actually found, found to us, they were known to my aunt and uncle, three more siblings, adding up to five of my mother's siblings, ranging in age from 92 to 80 years old, all born in Jamaica, one of whom was mixed race like my mother, the 92 year old, everyone else fully Han Chinese. And we were greeted by more than 300 of my grandfather's direct descendants, most of whom, except for five of them, the children of my mixed race aunt, all of the others were fully Chinese. Now, what does that mean and what does that say? That's not the usual story you hear in the United States about black people who are mixed with other races. Um, however, it's a very common story in Jamaica, Cuba, Trinidad and Tobago, Panama, Peru, Venezuela. We're everywhere throughout the Caribbean and Latin America and there is a very large number of Hakka Chinese Jamaicans 
who live in Toronto, Canada. Just as there are a significant number in Singapore and Kuala Lumpur, where I visited, and in Hong Kong. But these are not the stories that we hear as Black people, as African Americans. What we're not hearing is that we are in places such as that. I've had people ask me, um, what do you think about the Chinese going into Africa? The Chinese are very much present in many of the 54 nations of Africa. The Chinese have been present in some of the 54 nations of Africa since the 1830s. This is not new. This is not new. There have been excursions around the world where the Chinese have ventured out even before Christopher Columbus into parts of what we call the new world. And so that is how and why, if you have gone to Ancestry.com or AfricanAncestry.com or 24andMe, if you've had your DNA analyzed, sometimes as a person of the African diaspora, you might find 2% Chinese, 5% Chinese. And that is because wherever the Chinese have gone, in most instances, they have been Chinese men. And, and as happens, they have had children with the indigenous local women. So why I am bringing all this up is because I found it so fascinating. Last week, uh, I have a dual citizenship with the United States and with Jamaica. I found it fascinating last week um, when I, having been an executive at NBC, I think I attended maybe 10 Olympics, winter and summer. But I woke up one morning last week and the headline said, Italian fastest man in the world. And I thought, Italian? We went from my fellow Jamaican Usain Bolt being the fastest man in the world to Italian being fastest man in the world. And then I went deeper and looked and saw the picture. The Italian is in fact the fastest man in the world. His father is African-American and his mother is Italian. Naomi Osaka, her mother is Japanese. Her father is Haitian. Um, the basketball teams, the track stars, the wrestlers, shot put. What we're seeing is the world is shrinking um, in that wherever there are people, you're going to find more people who usually have immigrated from somewhere to this place. And what we are finding, of course, is that there are so many more mixed race people occurring on a daily basis to the fact that the fastest growing demographic in the United States racially is mixed race because people love who they love as they should, right? The importance of us as people of the African diaspora having a global perspective on the world becomes very, very important when, for example, again, I'll go back to the Chinese into Africa. I, I've been asked, how do I feel about that? What do you think about that? What do you think about the, the Chinese and their moving into Africa and African nations at such rates? And I say, if you remember those photos and video of Earth from outer space, you would see photos and videos of when the astronauts or the satellites were passing over Africa, that there was almost 
a, an unbelievable contrast between how not lit up Africa was versus how lit up North America, Europe were. That has everything to do with the building out of an infrastructure. And so the uh, Belt and Road Initiative that Xi Jinping of China has pursued with great devotion and commitment has resulted in China building roads, China developing um, electricity throughout many of the nations in Africa in exchange for China being allowed to develop also some of the natural resources, some of the coastal points, for example, building um, hotels so that tourism can thrive. Criticism has been, yeah, but the Chinese are not hiring local people. True. And that's because they have a process. They are importing Chinese workers who have been taught how to build these um, roads, bridges, highways, um, hydroelectric plants in a certain way over a certain amount of time. And usually what happens is they go in, they construct, most of them leave, some stay behind. Some do stay behind because they've learned to love the nation that they've worked in. They've learned to have relationships with the people in those nations and they've stayed. But today, in today's China, for example, where I have taken uh, groups of black people with me, groups of Chinese Americans with me, um, because uh, I don't know that you can get, get a better education than travel. So I've taken them there and shown how in every province in China, there are provincial offices to assist overseas Chinese, of which I would be considered one, to assist them in how to find their families, how to find their ancestral villages. So I showed you earlier this book, which was published by Harper Collins in 2014. This is the book I wrote called Finding Samuel Lowe. I, uh, that was my grandfather's um, Western name. His Chinese name was Luo Ting Chao. When I asked Harper Collins that they intend to publish a Chinese version, Chinese language version, they said no. So I asked and negotiated to get the rights back. This is a copy of the first edition of Finding Samuel Lowe, written in Chinese and published by Shenzhen Publishing um, in China. Here's the second edition, same book, different cover. They emphasized uh, certain photos and graphs that were not emphasized the same way. One is, seems to be targeted more towards researchers and the other towards more casual readers. What's the point? Well, the point is, is that these books have been recommended by the Ministry of Education in China for reading by high school and college students. Why? Because China is broadening its definition of who is Chinese? I've been on television in China. And the show that I was on with my first cousin, Han Chinese, he speaks Mandarin, Cantonese, Hakka, and a little bit of English. I only speak English. But we appeared together on this show that was seen by 30, 30, 30 million Chinese on CCTV at which point there was great excitement over someone looking like me being Chinese. I have here another book that was written at the direction of my mother's 88, then 88 year old brother, my uncle Jawu, who I met through 
the research and, and, and contacting people. And in that book, he corrects a long-standing, millennial long-standing practice in China of keeping family journals, which are called Japu, Japu. These family journals are mostly written about the men in the family. Excuse me, women are usually only referred to as mother of, sister of, daughter of. Um, but when I found my family, I asked my uncle if my mother could be included in our family's Japu, which goes back 3,000 years to the year 1006 BC. I am in the 151st generation of the Lo clan of Lo Sui Hap China. My uncle explained through an interpreter that women are not usually included in that way. Anybody who knows me knows that I don't take no easily. And so four months later, when my brothers and I return to China to meet the family, they had published this book. And in this book, my mother, and the women of her generation are featured as the same in the same manner that the men of their generation are featured. So this is a brand new approach to how China is thinking of women. Um, and they, they, they're crediting the fact that I showed up and even asked because women ordinarily know not to ask I come from a different culture. I come with a different perspective. And I ask, can my mother be included in the book? And she is in fact included in the book, as am I and all the females. I have about now maybe 45 first cousins who live in China and Australia and the UK and England and Jamaica and Canada and the United States but we're all first cousins. Um, and the importance of this is that what we as people of the African diaspora should know, particularly as you're going out into the world, is that as Kelly was saying a moment ago, once you have your creative vehicle, there's so much more that can be done with it. This book, presently is in development for a television series that has guaranteed distribution in China on China TV. It also is will be seen here in the West. The two studios that are developing this, and I'm an executive producer, are Amazon and Legendary. Legendary, you probably heard of. You might not be aware that Legendary is a Chinese studio based in Beijing. Why is all of this important? As I explained, the world is getting smaller by the moment. The stories that we have to tell of people of the African diaspora are very, very interesting globally. But if we don't travel outside of the borders of this nation, how are we to know that? I'm not saying leave the United States for good, not at all. I'm saying understand that media is media, entertainment is entertainment, great stories are great stories, and the world is very interested in knowing what we have who are overwhelmingly the arbiters of popular culture around the world. Go to China, they won't follow you around anymore. They won't look in wonderment anymore because, oh my God, there's a black person because they've seen many of us. But I have stood up in China and said, if China awarded dual citizenship as United States does and many other nations, and everyone who was eligible for dual citizenship was in fact granted dual citizenship, there would be not 1.4 billion Chinese, there would be 
four billion Chinese. And their reaction is this. Chinese stand up and applaud wildly because what they understand is it's the, it's the propagation of the civilization. It's the propagation of the culture. And on that, what I'd like to leave you with is, um, my name is Paula Madison in the United States. My name in Ghana, which is where more than 95% of Jamaicans hail from, is Nana Akosua Barnier. I was awarded that name by the Asatehene, the king of the Ashanti people. And in China, my name is Luo Xiao Na. Luo, which is my surname, Xia, which is my generation name. All of the women in my generation have that name. And Na means beauty. I was given that name by my Chinese uncle who told me I was beautiful. I hope you enjoyed my story. If you'd like to reach out to me, the easiest email for me is Paula Madison at yahoo.com. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed my narrative. Have a good conference. Paula, your narrative was just absolutely breathtaking. My jaw is still on the floor that you were able to go, to find 3,000 years of, of your history and your story. Um, and, and you're absolutely correct. Yes, the world is, is getting smaller. We are all much more connected than we realize, um, which could which branches off into other stories of, of, of how we can come together as a people and, and really grow. So thank you so much, Paula, for sharing your story. Um, every one of you out there, I hope you're enjoying this conference thus far. I mean, the storytelling, the passion, I'm, I'm locked in and loaded. Um, and if you're enjoying the conference as well, please continue to share using hashtag HCF2021 and hashtag Hollywood Creative Forum. We all have a story to tell. Beautiful, complex, fascinating stories. Told through a lens of varying shades and experiences. That's the power of art imitating life. It cannot be defined or confined to one space. So let your creativity soar. Fill the page, press record, and dare to captivate the masses with your authentic voice. We all have a story to tell. What's yours?